to see some very familiar faces. Thanks for coming back. Is anybody first time at one of my sessions today? Thanks for joining us. It's, um, it, it's great because what I've found is the longer I do these things, you build a little bit of momentum uh, over time. The people, they realize that you're doing something different every single time you present, and they realize that they're going to get decent value every time that they come in. At least I like to think that they get decent value. You can tell me otherwise. Um, but it, it's great. I certainly uh, I do appreciate that you've taken time out of your day, especially where it's a lot nicer today. I mean, I thought it was going to be bucketing rain, much like it was yesterday. So it's, uh, it's really good to see that the weather's improved. If anybody's going to go up top later and watch the footy, uh, which is fantastic. So for most of you know who I am, but for first timers, my name is Logan. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for well over 30 years. Um, you can tell I'm completely bald. Uh, that's kind of a side effect of being in cybersecurity. No, actually, I lost my hair when I was 16, so uh, then again, I started my career when I was 16, so maybe that's just magic. So the first thing I want to do is a little bit of housekeeping, and I really want to express a bit of gratitude. And I wouldn't be able to do this sort of thing without, you know, everyone like you guys, businesses, uh, everybody that provides me some information. So the feedback that I've been getting is absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate it. Um, so whenever you do have helpful feedback, constructive criticism or anything like that, I welcome the opportunity to take that on board because what I find is we might have something to offer up as a matter of suggestion, but often it doesn't quite go through the right channels. You know, we'll throw it up on Facebook or something like that. It just doesn't get to the people in time for it to really make a difference. So for those of you who have taken time to come up and speak with me afterwards and offer up some suggestions, thank you very much. It's very helpful. And you're not just helping me. You're helping everyone else on the cruise as well because when I do a session and I get feedback immediately after the session, I can incorporate it going forward. So that way, you're helping others at the same time by doing this. And more than that, you're actually going to be helping people on other cruises, because I do this on a regular basis. So the feedback that I get while I'm doing these sessions, I incorporate it and then I take it to the next cruise. So if anybody would have ever come to one of the first sessions I did quite some time ago, they'd realize that it's so different from what I'm presenting now, because I've been able to incorporate that feedback. Cybersecurity is a changing landscape and things do happen, but I think one of the most important things is listening to people and taking their experiences on board. And part of the reason I started this project in the first place was to help everyone for the simple reason is whenever something happens to a company like Optus or Medibank, we tend to get forgotten. We get the throwaway statements, we apologize for the inconvenience, and they don't really help us out. We're just simply a replaceable commodity. I don't see it that way. I take every opportunity that I can to give as much information as I can, completely free of charge, because I'm never going to charge for my podcast or my YouTube channel or anything like that. That's just not me. Because if I can make the difference in one person's life and keep them from getting scanned, that's a win. So thank you very much. I do have to put up a disclaimer before this one, because uh, it does touch on some rather sensitive content. Um, this is all based purely on my opinion, my experience, you know, my nearly four decades doing this stuff. Um, so one of the things is always get appropriate legal advice, particularly what you're dealing with anything that has like a legal implication. Uh, ransomware in and of itself doesn't, but the consequences of paying a ransom, uh, insurance matters, these other sort of things do carry legal consequences. So everything I'm presenting is purely opinion based. Um, I do stand behind what I say. Because I've been doing this long enough. Good afternoon everyone, this is the captain. Well, if you are on the open decks, so you can see on the port side, you may not see land, and this is indeed Australia. We're currently making our way to the rendezvous position to meet the helicopter, and unfortunately we've just heard that the helicopter has been delayed, and they do not have definitive information yet on what time it will arrive. In the meantime, we're going to head down to the rendezvous position and do a slow turn and uh, wait and see if we get uh, the helicopter out to us. My friend, I don't have much information for you. That's all I have. The Rescue Coordination Center is unable to give me a positive time. However, we have everything ready for the helicopter, should it appear, and I'll let you know with a further update. Thanks for your patience, and enjoy your time. <laughs> Just as a matter of curiosity, has anybody been on a cruise ship when there's been an evacuation before, like a helipad? 
It's surprising how often that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm truly thankful that they uh, they do have that capability where we can be close enough to land where they can actually come over the helicopter and rescue someone. It does make a tremendous difference. Because time was, we didn't always have that option, so I'm very grateful for this. So, back to the Prezo. In addition to getting proper legal advice, seek assistance from the authorities. They do have specialized units that deal specifically with cybercrime. I do occasionally work with state and territory police, the AFP, uh, on certain matters. Um, and they have, they have some amazing individuals that work for them. So don't hesitate to reach out to the local coppers or the AFP or go online through, say, the Australian Cyber Security Center. Um, I have some links at the very end of this that I'll share um, for, for, for advice. They, they live and breathe this much like myself, except they've got the power to be able to do a lot more. So a little bit of an overview, we're going to talk about what is ransomware. I mean, we may have heard it in the news, but I'll kind of give you a bit of an explanation as to what ransomware and ransom happens to be. Uh, it is very much the way that you imagine ransom. Uh, it's just kind of like the online version of it. Uh, we're going to take stock, so if something happens that you find yourself in a ransomware attack, you know, how do I kind of handle this? Because it's like a lot of other cyber attacks, you freeze, you start to panic, you don't know how to re respond and react. So I'm hoping that I can provide at least some of the preliminary steps of things to think about. Now, cyber insurance has, it's come and gone in popularity. Um, I first started talking about cyber insurance about 15 years ago. It's gained in popularity. I'll, I'll put some thoughts out on that. Again, a purely opinion, you know, don't take it to the bank by any stretch because you're not going to get any money for it. Um, the question is always, should I or should I not pay a ransom? That is probably the most important detail of this presentation is whether or not you should pay a ransom. And I can't tell you yes or no, that is a very personal decision to take, uh, but one that I don't want you to take lightly, and that you take an informed decision if you find yourself in a situation, as many individuals and businesses have over the last several years. It is growing in popularity. It is probably one of the most rapidly growing threats that cyber criminals use. The hackers absolutely love it because it's tremendously effective. Um, I want you to take action with support. I'll give you some key takeaways, and then we'll have a question and answer at the end. Uh, I'll do my absolute best to answer a lot of it. Some information I may not be able to share, um, but if you stay in contact with me after the cruise, I'm more than happy to try to dig it up for you. So who's familiar with the concept of ransom? We, we, should, we should be all familiar with the concept of ransom. You know, pay me or give me this, or else I'm going to do this, right? Ransomware or ransom, tends to work the exact same way online. Um, it's not as physically intrusive, although that is an element of it. You know, things like kidnappings, actual physical property theft, these other sort of things still do very much happen, uh, especially aligned with electronics, especially if somebody is in possession of tremendously sensitive information. Um, that is almost a form of this. So there's two real forms of attacks when it comes to ransomware. And that's direct attacks and indirect attacks. Now, direct attacks is more like the ransomware. And the reason that where is stuck on the ransomware is because it's a computer application or program specifically designed to commit ransom. It's called CryptoLocker or something like this. Uh, there, there's quite a few varieties of it out there. And the purpose is that once this gets onto your computer, it basically renders your computer useless or it locks up your data until you actually pay the ransom to either get the services of your computer back or to have them release the data by providing you an encryption key. So it's encrypted, they basically can munch it all together with a secret code, only they have that code and they will give you that code when you pay the ransom, maybe, and I will touch on that after. Um, it's a denial of service or a loss of data access, that's the biggest thing, you lose access to something. Your computer is still physically sitting there in front of you, your phone is in your pocket, but it's locked up, you can't use it, you can't access the data, or you might have limited access to it. It basically becomes a brick or a boat anchor. Now, if you've got older computers, it's probably indistinguishable whether or not it's a brick or not, uh, but I digress. There's a few different variations of it, Locky, WannaCry, that definitely made the news quite a few years ago. There was a WannaCry uh, crypto attack that took over a lot of computers. I think it hit a couple of the uh, UK health systems pretty hard. Bad Rabbit, I've seen that in limited use. Petcho is another one that came around just about the same time as WannaCry. And CryptoLocker is an actual name of a product, it just tends to be one of those generic terms that we, or genericized terms that we use. Um, you know, I've been CryptoLockered, or I've been hit by a CryptoLocker attack, when CryptoLocker is really only one program that actually does this sort of thing. 
Now, those type of attacks are diminishing, but they're not going away. And that's one of the points that I really want to make with cybersecurity is just because it's not prevalent or it's not news or we're not all talking about it doesn't mean that these threats go away. There are still viruses that come out 15, 20, 25 years ago that are still floating around out there and can, in fact, have an impact on your systems. So it's like this never-ending pile. It never goes down. It just only ever gets bigger. And that's the one thing to remember about it. And uh, even though you know, your computer's not getting ransomware and locked up, it still is very much a threat. What we're seeing more of these days are indirect attacks. And that's an attack against the business and service that we use. For example, Medibank. You know, Medibank was basically hit by a ransomware attack. Medibank's response to it, yeah, a lot of people would disagree with it, but they actually probably handled it better than most. There was no process of denial. It's like, yep, yeah, we're done. Let's handle this. The big problem that I had with them is the fact that they were holding on to data far beyond what they were supposed to. Data stewardship is very, very important, but that's a topic for another day. So let's just say you know, Optus Medibank will latitude pick one that might be subject to a ransomware attack. And they work a little bit differently, and it usually comes down to a threat of action. Either give us the money, or we're going to release your data out into the wild. You know, we'll publish everybody's driver's licenses and passwords out on the dark web for people to buy. Unless you pay us this money and then we'll delete it. Whether or not you trust them is a completely another matter altogether. But that's kind of the modus, is pay or else we do. And then there's a pay or else we expose angle. And here's the interesting angle. I've ran into a few ransomware attacks where they didn't actually compromise the systems. They just let the businesses believe that they compromised the systems. And while these businesses were scrambling madly to figure out how they got in and what they did, they were still under the threat of exposure. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how they get in. But the main thing to remember is it's either going to be a direct attack, less likely, or an indirect attack. And because we were all hamstrung by having to use online services for everything, you know, from banking to name it, we're kind of at the mercy of these sort of things. Now, the third point on here is quite interesting, is you can buy ransomware as a service. That's right, folks. For a limited time offer, if you happen to have a little bit of spare money kicking around and you have an axe to grind with a business, you can actually hire a bad guy to ransomware somebody. So if you've got a real problem with somebody, you say, hey, uh, Mr. Uh, dark Web Hacker guy with the dark hoodie whose face I can't see, can you do this to these people for four bitcoins? It's a lot of money. I didn't think about four bitcoins, but you know, this, this is the thing. You can get ransomware as a service. You know, in my world, we have software as a service, or SaaS. There's platform as a service. There's infrastructure as a service. So why not ransomware as a service, you know? People will pay for anything these days. So how does it work? It's basically four steps. Infiltration. It's basically they get in somehow. So a hacker gains access to your systems and information. And how they do that? Good old phishing. Phishing emails, SMS messages, direct messages through social media. So they try to fish you. Click on this link. You know, uh, your account is locked out. Your Netflix is about to expire. You've got a speeding. Find some sort of a lure is what they're trying to get you with the phishing attack. To a lesser degree, vulnerabilities. You know. They've discovered a hole in the system, so they exploit it. They use that hole to get into the system, launch their little program, and ransomware them. Or exfiltrate the data and steal it. Malware. So malware is just a portmanteau. They've basically taken malicious and software and munched them together in one word, malware. Um, that's been around so long now that we're, getting, we're slowly getting used to malware. Uh, that's why I say ransomware, malware, everything's where of some sort. You know, back in the 2000s, before the dot-com collapse, there was vaporware. You know, big companies were jumping up. We've got an idea, and they were throwing money at it, and it just became vaporware because nothing ever got actually created. Uh, but in this case, it's a real and present danger. And weak passwords. Now, I'm probably going to hammer on passwords throughout, but they need a way to get into the system. So if you've got a weak password, a vulnerability, they fish you and you give them your password. That's basically how they get in. And then they execute. So they encrypt the systems and information. So they might lock up all the servers. Um, I'm seeing less of that in the business world these days, particularly where a lot of stuff is cloud-based. You know, it's either in Amazon Web Services or in Microsoft Cloud. So it's a lot harder for them to access. What I'm seeing more is they're finding weaknesses, like exploiting the humans. Very few hackers actually hack systems anymore. They mostly hack people, because we are the weak link. And I'll give you some ideas on how we can defend against it. You probably, if you've been to multiple sessions, you know where I'm going to go with this. 
exfiltration of data. So what they'll do is they'll most likely just take a copy of your data. Because a copy of your data is just as good as the original data itself. They don't actually have to take your data and then delete what's on the server. They just take a copy of it. Because uh, a copy of a driver's license is every bit as good as the original document. Then they take control of your systems that have information. So let's just say that they block everything up. Maybe what they've done is they've gone in and they had administrator rights. And then they've shut everybody else out of the system and taken control of it. So it's your computer network, your servers, but someone else is controlling them. Which is quite scary for a big business that all of a sudden they've got somebody else in charge of things. Used to be a time when they said, just pull a blue cable, right? Has anybody ever heard of that one? Just pull a blue cable? Well, with everything cloud-based, that doesn't work anymore. What you've basically done is shut yourself out at the same time. I mean, there still are some organizations that run purely on on-premise, physical server hardware in their offices, but there's not many of them. They tend to be very, very specialized. Government, um, education, some finance places, because they're just that sensitive about controlling everything. So after they've done this, then comes the demand with threats. Pay us X, or else we will Y. And that's just the way that it tends to roll. Uh, it can be either we need to pay us, or you need to give us information, or something. They want something in exchange for releasing control of your data, deleting the copy that they have, giving your system control back, something like that. And then the pressure comes on to you. You have to make a decision. Do you say, yes, I'll pay it? Or you'll say, no, I'm not going to pay it. So that's ultimately what it comes down to. There can be a degree in negotiation. I have deliberately ransomware my own computer before, a test box, mind you, to see what the process was. And they started out asking for an astronomical amount of money, and I managed to negotiate them down to $1,000, which was quite interesting. They're just looking to get paid. Um, there, there's other parts that go along with that. But and then they respond. So if you pay, maybe they release control. You know, maybe they release the data. Like for example, if you've got your local computers locked up, they'll give you the encryption key. Happy days, you've got your stuff back. Or they'll erase their copy. Now whether or not you believe them is up to you. Or they'll destroy it, destroy your systems, destroy your logins, basically render it completely and utterly useless. Uh, if they can't have it, then neither can you. They'll publish the data, which is quite common, and that's probably the most common threat that you're going to find from someone using ransomware. Pay us or else we're going to release all this public data to the internet. And people are very sensitive about their information. Every single person in this room has got sensitive information that we don't want published on the dark web. And, or they can even sell it to other cyber criminals. Let's just say that you don't pay them any ransom, and well, let's say, well, hang on a second. What I'll do is I'll sell this information to another hacker, and they'll just use it to try to extort these people in the first place. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because usually the attackers that do the original breach and take the data are very rarely the ones that actually use the data to exploit people. What they do is they'll, if they'll steal a million records, they'll all package that up into like little packages of 10,000 records. Here's some for you, and some for you, and some for you. If it was Oprah, you get a data breach, you get a data breach, you get a data breach. And you can see how it works. So there's an example of what a screen would actually look like if your local computer was bricked. Now this is 2017, it's seven years old, but like I said, this stuff is still very much around. Uh, but that's what your screen would basically look like. And look, you know, Bitcoin accepted here. And there's the address where you can say it. Check the payment, decrypt, that's when they send you the key. They've actually got, even some places, uh, a contact us button. Yeah, some of these cyber criminal organizations actually just have help desks, believe it or not. They will actually step you through, step by step, the process of how to send the money if you've never dealt with Bitcoin before, which many people have not, and how to pay them, and then how to use the key to decrypt it and stuff like that. Thank you very much for your business. Have a nice day. And I'm not kidding. Why are they motivated? I think that first one pretty much speaks for them. It's financial. It's payday. It's a job for them. I've mentioned in previous sessions that there are some hacking organizations, some cybercrime syndicates that are out there that will rival some of the largest corporations on earth. They have hierarchies, they have leadership, they get time off, they have targets, they get promotions, they have Christmas parties, and yes, in fact, they do have the Friday afternoon office pizza party. Hey, regular corporations reward us with those pizza parties all the time, why shouldn't the Grimm's? 
Manipulation is another one. Is making information or making others reveal sensitive information. You know, we'll do this unless you tell us this. Give us, you know, some intellectual property. Give us the code that makes this program work. Kind of an extortion side of things. Interference. I mean, it, all you have to do is look at the 2016 U.S. presidential election and the interference with the uh, the, the Russian operators. Uh, I have a feeling that this one's going to be even worse. I'm just conjecturing, but it, it could even be worse. Uh, so there could be very much, you know, motivation there. The other thing is reducing competition. Yes, that's right. It's just like the corporate world. They, in fact, compete with one another. There's many, many ransomware games that are out there that actually compete with one another. They're trying to, they actually try to ransomware one another. It's like the Hunger Games, except online with a bunch of criminals. It gets real entertaining. Like, you can start out, and you'll have a hundred different syndicates, and a few years down the road, you'll have four or five. Just process of elimination. Or they actually actively take one and over, like hostile mergers and acquisitions. So you can see how cyber criminals and big corporations kind of work the same. Now, I'm not saying that, cyber, that big corporations are criminal. You draw your own conclusion on that, but just be aware that that's just this leverage they have. It's no longer the lone wolves sitting in mom's basement with a hoodie on, you know, you can't see their face, dark blue, all that sort of stuff. They're probably sitting at Starbucks, horrible, horrible coffee. That's probably what makes them angry enough to do this in the first place. And of course, there's ego, there's bragging rights. There is serious, serious social media clout online. It's not Facebook, oh, it's on like Facebook, but they basically, their reputation is their stock and trade. So you remember quite a few weeks ago that they exposed that they had found this hacker supposedly in charge of Medibank breach, and they exposed his name and stuff like that. That's a whole lot of notoriety for them. You know, all of a sudden these people know who he is. I tend to believe that this person will either disappear for whatever reason or will reemerge in a different format. Oh, he can't come to Australia. Boo. Oh. They don't. They don't want him here anyway. Okay, so here's a few quick numbers. Now, I'm not really a big fan of throwing up numbers because I think they're all skewed because we never get the full picture. People get compromised that never know they're compromised. They overstate it. They understate it. There's a whole variety of reasons. And sometimes they just plain simple don't know. Just in a year, it's almost doubled. From 2022 to 2023, the average, this is average. You know how big those numbers have to be to get an average like that? Yeah. Went from 812 grand, one and a half mil in a year. Some circles I've talked to said for 2024, we could start to see that number the best part of three. Yes. And interestingly enough, only 8% of businesses that choose to pay it actually get all of their data back. So what about the other 92%? Part of it? Most likely none of it. And according to a report, about 88% attempted to infect backup repositories. One of the countermeasures to ransomware or any type of cyber attack is having a good backup. That way that if you go down, you can restore your systems and be back in business. So what do you do? Attack the backup. So you can imagine this business that gets hit by a ransomware attack, and they say, no, we're not going to pay you, get stuffed. We're just going to flip over to our backup and uh, where, where did it go? Oh, no. And I have seen that happen. 75% of them were successful. Why? It's probably because most of the energy and time and resources that businesses have is focused on their primary source of business, the main systems, the one they use day in, day out. They don't put enough time and effort into the backup systems to rely on them enough. So when I go into a place and I do a consulting gig, I say, have you tested your backup? Have you tested your disaster recovery? Have you tested your incident response plan? Well, we did a tabletop exercise at lunch on Friday, and everybody said, yeah, this will work. Have you tried it in anger, is what I want to know. And very few do. You know, 22 days of downtime. Now, there used to be a time when if you went offline, you could basically be offline for weeks, and eh, you know, we'd just do everything by hand. Those days are long gone. You know, if you're, if you're offline, you're dead. You're dead in the water. 22 days, that's three weeks. Can you imagine most companies that lose three weeks worth of trading? And we're not talking about shutting down over the Christmas break or something like that. We're talking being completely unable to trade. And in addition to the loss of business, then there's all the extra cost, overhead, that you have to try to get everything back up. And people like me are not cheap. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, 
phishing emails, lack of training, and weak passwords, you'll start to see a theme, the phishing. The phishing is probably one of the easiest ways to get in, weak credentials, or they steal your credentials, uh, and a lack of training. Cybersecurity awareness training is getting better, but it's still got a long way to go. And in a lot of businesses that actually do training, it's usually click, 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 click. Congratulations, you finished your training for the year. That's it. The only ones that I get a little cage on is whenever they do a phishing test. Now, the purpose of a phishing test is you send a phishing email to your staff and then see who reacts to it, who opens it, who clicks on it, who provides their credentials. That's very, very valuable information. Then you know what areas of the business to target to help your people, and that's the way I look at it. You know, by using these exercises, I learn how I can help people defend against it. Unfortunately, some businesses have taken a different approach, and they punish people. Um, you know, it's been held against them in their KPIs, in terms of raises, in terms of promotions, used as a stick to beat people. So whenever they get the corporate newsletter that comes in, click here to read this month's newsletter, people go, I'm not touching that. And then they wonder why nobody wants to read their newsletters. No, seriously. I, I probably ran into at least five places like that within the last couple of years. And three out of four managed service providers, that's what MSP stands for, is a managed service provider, somebody that looks after your stuff on your behalf. Because not every company has the time and the money to be able to hire the people in-house to be able to look after things, so they outsource it. Uh, I've worked for quite a few of these outsourcers over the years. They're very good at it. Uh, they're worth every penny. In this particular case, because they're looking after things, some of them actually get a lot of their customers back up within 24 hours, which is really good. Something happens, they pick up the phone, they call this managed service provider, and they're on it. They've got playbooks they just execute, and they just do. And they're worth it. So if you're involved in a business that has an outsourced MSP, uh, hopefully they're good, but just know that most of them do train for this type of eventuality. So if the cyber criminals don't get what they want, what else can they do? You know, they're not getting paid, but wait a minute, let's use the law. That's right. So the Russian ransomware gang, Alpha B, also known as Black Cat, they compromised a company called Meridian Link. They said, We've got your information, and we're going to release it under the dark web unless you pay us, or it was 20 bitcoins or something like that. So Meridian Link turns around and says, no, we're not paying it. So they reported on the Security Exchanges Commission. Now initially when that story broke, I thought it was hoopla. I thought it was bull. Then they posted a picture of the screenshot of them actually filling out the form on the SEC website to actually daub in Meridian Link to say that they were victims of a cyber crime because I don't think Meridian Link was actually going to report it voluntarily. Then I said, yeah, yeah, you just filled out the thing. And then they posted a picture of the actual confirmation back from the SEC to state, thank you very much, we will begin investigating this very soon. So, interesting type of tactic. Um, and the unofficial one, now I mentioned this in, the, in one of my sessions the other day, uh, I'm still trying to find out more about it, was apparently the same group, Black Cat LV, were in the process of compromising a rather large global charity and found evidence of widespread corruption within this charity and has threatened to expose them for this unless they pay up. I can't find any publicly available stuff to be able to validate this, otherwise I'd share it. But I've gotten it on fairly good authority from, yes, they're questionable people, but they're also very reliable sources. So if I do happen to find that out, that will make its way into the future. So for the time being, I'm not naming anybody. And you gotta remember that when it comes to cybercrime, it's not always about the hackers. It is not always about things they do. And sometimes it's not all about the things that businesses do. And here's two crime examples that have been in the news fairly recently. 23andMe, which probably worries me a bit more because it actually has you know, very sensitive genetic information, and the iconic, who a lot of people have bought stuff through online. Uh, they weren't necessarily hit by ransomware, uh, but they were hit by a data breach. And the way they got in was simply by guessing passwords, and people were signing up. I was like, okay. So that, that seems funny that a business would set it up and allow people to use a weak password. We know how I go on about having a fairly strong password. So I went to the Iconic, and to 23andMe, and went to set up an account and wanted to see what do you want for a password. In most cases, they only needed a minimum of six characters to create a password. 
the Iconics case, they didn't even specify that it needed to be a complex password. So I tried one, two, three, four, five, six, and it accepted it. Oh, no. <laughs> and a lot of other people would. Because humans, electricity, and water follow the path of least resistance. That's because humans are water powered by electricity. Figure that one. They didn't even have an option for multi-factor authentication. So I mean, even if you use a cheap password or a loose password, if you use that secondary method of authentication by getting that code come to your phone or having the app on your phone with that code, at least then you've got a, a stopgap to say, oh, someone's got my password, I can change it because you know it triggers you looking for that MFA code. So when you don't have that multi-factor authentication code, it's in you go. 23andMe actually does have two-factor authentication available on its site, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to set it up. Now, if it was up to me, if you're a business and you have sensitive information, that extra layer of security should be mandatory. I haven't looked at them recently, but I believe that there's probably a few things changing. So the first thing to do in a ransomware attack, and this is where you really kind of have to go, relax for a second, what happened? And this is where you grab a notebook and you start writing things down. And try to take as many details as you can. You're probably not going to know everything, but just write everything down. Oh, I was on my email and I saw this, this, you know, this link pop up and I clicked on it. You know, when did that happen? Were you at work? Were you at home? Any little details that you can write down will become very helpful. You know, and then you say, okay, well, what have they got? You know, I can't get into my email. Uh, my bank account details have changed. What have they got access to? That's the other things. And it doesn't actually have to be war and peace when you write it out. Just some good details that can help you and can have help the authorities. And then you ask yourself, what might happen as a result? Well, I won't be able to pay my rent, or I can't pay my mortgage, or something else. Or I won't be able to phone somebody if they've locked out your, your account. If it's social media, oh, they're going to put nasty things about me on social media, which could possibly happen. Or they could use it to try to compromise other things. Just try to think. And one of the most important things is to get someone else. Don't stay silent. If you've got a trusted friend, family member, colleague, boss, somebody that you can get to be kind of that one step detached is very helpful. That other set of eyes. Well, what about this? Have you thought about this sort of thing? Very, very helpful. Even if you don't have anybody, ring the authorities. Get on the cops because they have specialist units and they can help walk you through this process of gathering some information. You may not have this initially. What happens if I don't pay? Are they threatening to delete all your stuff? Are they threatening to expose your information? People tend to keep, well, some people, tend to keep salacious stuff on their phones or in their iCloud or in the OneDrive. And if that gets leaked out, what's the consequence? Any little details you can capture. And then what's your options? And this, I'm going to keep hitting this point again, always get help. So now that you've got some basic understanding of what's happened, now, what are my options? What can I do? Number one, you can pay the ransom and gamble that the cyber criminal, the hacker, is going to do what they say. Funnily enough, there is a bit of a code of honor amongst them because some cyber criminals don't want to get a reputation for not paying or not honoring their word. They treat it like a business transaction. It's not personal, it's a business transaction to them. And like most businesses, your reputation is key. Yes, there's some very dirty actors out there, but it's still a gamble. Or don't pay and risk the consequences. You may have an understanding of what those consequences are or because of the cyber criminal. Mr. Hacker, Mr. Hoodie, has probably told you what he's going to do. And then the question is, okay, can you recover without paying? Do you have a backup? So if you turn around and tell this hacker to get stuffed, I'm not paying you, what's the consequences? Can you recover? Because first and foremost, if you're a business, you want to continue doing business. If it's locked up your personal account, you still want access to your files, you know, your tax data, your pictures, that sort of stuff. Can I continue on without it? You know, that could incur other consequences. The data might still get leaked, but can you kind of keep living as it is? And then ask questions. Try to learn as much as you can. Remember the button that said contact us on that <laughs> ransomware page? They're more than willing to negotiate with you. As long as they think they're going to get a payday, they're more than happy to chat with you. 
they'll probably tell you to go to WhatsApp or some encrypted messenger or something like that, but they will engage you in conversations. You know, is it a negotiation tactic or a delay tactic? They don't care as long as they're going to get paid. But your patience has a limit, so you can't just waffle and take your time while you're making a decision. And believe, realize there is going to be pressure applied. They want to get paid, they want to move on to the next victim. And for all you know, they've probably got 10, 20, 1,000 different victims all gone to go at the same time. So there's pressure, they want to keep going. Remember when I was telling you about that they work like corporations? You know, timelines, deadlines, all that sort of thing? Criminal organizations work exactly like that. So paying a ransom essentially means you have to trust the same people that just committed a crime against you. So that's one of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're contemplating whether or not you are going to pay. Do I trust them? Because you have to. So what about cyber insurance? Now this is probably not necessarily so topical to this particular group, but I think I'd mention it anyway, because as an evolution of cyber insurance and all things insurance, you can get cyber insurance as an individual. The cheapest one I've seen so far is about worth $1,000 a year, but it is a minefield. Uh, having been in some positions, I've seen questionnaires that are 100 pages long. Right. I mean, look, we're, we're dealing with a multi-billion dollar corporation. So, of course, the questionnaires are going to be lengthy. And it is hard to quantify. You know, because data, it has to have a finite value to be able to put a value against it for insurance. Uh, it is very hard to quantify. Like the systems is like, well, it's you know, two thousand dollars per server. Uh, consultant is say three thousand dollars a day. You can get some of those costs, but a lot of it's really hard to quantify. And, and it's usually the territory of cashed up businesses. Only the ones with the really deep pockets are the ones that are buying cyber insurance. But interestingly enough, it's also a cost of doing business. I have worked with some organizations that they had to have cyber insurance before they could transact with other businesses. It was just you have to have cyber insurance if you want to deal with us. Some policies will actually cover the cost of ransom. Now that's a cautious one. Because if a cyber criminal, Mr. Hacker, Mr. Hoodie, knows that you have a cyber insurance policy that pays ransom, guess who becomes a really attractive target? You become very interesting to them because then it almost assures them of a payday. A lot of insurance companies are moving away from this, but it is still very much there. It's more likely going to cost cover the cost of support and recovery. New servers, uh, the cost of consultants, uh, maybe some forensic specialists and stuff like that. It's more likely going to cover that. But they're loaded with clauses. Anybody that's ever read an insurance policy, great reading, it's just riveting stuff, knows that there are more clauses and outs and loopholes. It's like Swiss cheese in their favor. Cyber insurance is exactly the same way. Uh, there's one particular one where if you get compromised because you lost an unencrypted USB drive. A lot of businesses, they have a USB drive, you know, copy all your files onto it, stick it in the computer, oh, I'm going to take this home, you drop it on the train. Somebody gets a hold of it, information gets exposed. Well, how did that happen? USB, oh, sorry, policy is off the table. So there's actually companies that refuse to use USB sticks anymore. They say you have to use OneDrive or G Drive or something like that, but not the sticks. Just understand the policy intimately before purchasing. And that's why I say this is an opinion only. Get appropriate legal advice. There's people that are paid far better than I am to understand this stuff. And when you get into a bit of a situation, they're worth it. So should you pay or not? The premier question is, well, are they going to do as they say? Do you trust them after they've committed the crime? That is probably one of going to be the things. Because most people are willing to pay a price in order to get what they want. But you need assurances. So if I walked into a car dealer and I want to buy a new Hilux, and I said, okay, we'll give us 50 grand and we'll see about that. No, 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 no. It's much the same way. If I'm paying you for something, I want some assurances that I'm going to get that thing. Do you have to report it? Yes, as of 2021, you are obliged to report ransomware payments to the Australian Cyber Security Center. I didn't know if this was law or not, so I looked that up before I did this slide this morning. And yes, it came into effect in 2021. I haven't necessarily heard a whole lot about it, uh, like a lot of people disclosing whether or not they pay ransomware, because that's kind of information to keep close to the chest. It's kind of a bad look to say, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, we got that uh, breached and uh, we paid a ransom. Customers going, my mother here. So what happens if that you report it, where is it going to be disclosed? 
Well, government, surprisingly enough, will use a lot of that information for very good means because it gives them information to combat cybercrime. So by getting information from businesses, from the intelligence agencies, and from individuals like us, they actually have a better chance of stopping a lot of this, which I think is fantastic. Uh, what happens if you don't pay? Um, I would still probably report it regardless. Whether you've paid or not, I would still report it to the authorities, because it's more information that helps them do their job much better. What happens to your data? Well, that's anyone's guess. You might get say, well, we'll delete your data if you pay the ransom. How do you know? There's an interesting part I'll bring up here in a second, but if you pay and they release your data half a day and carry on, not always the case. And there's always that risk that it's just going to get sold and leaked anyway. Great, we got paid from this guy. Here, over to you. And then you get hit by another one. So 80% of organizations who paid it got hit again. That's fairly fresh data. So about 80% of organizations some businesses, I don't know about individuals, there's not a lot of data on that. 80% of businesses that pay ransom, it's like feeding a stray cat. Honestly, when it comes to cybercrime, it's like feeding a stray cat. And 46% of them, almost half, it was the same people that got them again. Let's see what else we can get. Incredible. And the 34% is like someone else. It's probably their buddy. Hey, this guy's an easy mark, go get him. That's legitimately the kind of conversations that they have in the dark web. I've got way too much time on my hands. So follow the money. So you paid the ransomware. Where does that money go? A whole lot of places you don't want it to. If there's any wonder how certain individuals can keep financing their efforts, one only has to look at the means by which they acquire their funding. War and armed conflict. I don't need to tell you any more than that. Terrorism. That's, that's been around forever. That is a means by which that they get their money. Human trafficking and slavery, that is the ugliest side of things. And it gets worse. Sure, you got drug trade cartels, organized crime. I mean, you got some of the cartels in South America that are better armed than half of the militaries on Earth. Yeah. And a means by getting that is a lot of cyber crime, hacking, ransomware, these sort of things. Uh, creation and distribution of abusive content. You know, ongoing cybercrime. So now they've got money, so they've got time. Money buys you time to be able to develop new methods. So when the authorities cotton on to something that works, what do the criminals do? Come up with something new. And that finances them. And then there's the recruitment, entrapment, and extortion of tax resources. <coughs> there is a part of human trafficking where they will actually traffic people to commit these crimes. And unfortunately, uh, they tend to target females because they'll get them on with some lonely bloke and just do the whole romance scam thing. So you can kind of see how that plays. I really don't like going too deep into these on these crew sessions. That's more kind of another thing that I do is I do some very, very specific talks on these topics. But the recruitment and entrapment side of things is the lure in people. They might see a kid that's got some exceptional computer skills say, hey, come work for us and make a whole lot of money. And then, of course, they use the allure that all these other charlatans use. The fancy cars, the big houses, the vacations, the money, and stuff like that. And once they're in, it's like any other type of organized crime. It's very hard to get out. So now it comes time to take action. And hopefully with this information, it is being recorded, so it will be available on YouTube. I'll try to put some additional links, whenever I post it on YouTube, some additional links, so you can follow some of these articles where I've sourced some of this information but it's time to take action, and the most important thing is to make an informed decision. Get as much information as you possibly can before you decide to pay a ransom, and that includes legal advice and speaking to the authorities. And be prepared to live with the consequences, because there's no going back. Once you've paid the ransom, that's it. You're not gonna get your money back. That's gonna disappear into some Bitcoin account and then get moved a dozen times. It's gone. There's no guarantee for criminals, so if they say, you know, pay us money, we'll release your account. Not always a guarantee. There's always legal consequences because if you pay and you don't disclose that you've paid, there can be some other consequences from the authorities. They're looking at this very, very closely, and not just specifically within Australia, all around the world, a lot of authorities are very closely monitoring what's happening with ransomware. Uh, you know, there could be business and personal liabilities, you're on the hook for these sort of things. Be honest enough from the communications. The minute you get yourself in a bit of strike, pick up the phone, 
call the police. You know, get a friend involved, get somebody to give you a hand through this, because it's not something I want anybody to ever have to face alone. Share your experience. I, this is completely voluntary. I, I've had some really interesting conversations with people that have been victims of ransomware and some really nasty ones. Um, a lot of that I will never share, but it's very eye-opening. But it does provide information that others can share to help people uh, and keep those detailed notes, because you just never know when they're going to come in. There's usual stuff, complex, unique passwords. I've mentioned this in a few other sessions. Please just go to my videos. I'm more than happy to give you a copy of the slide decks uh, where I talk about it. There's other videos actually on my channel where I talk specifically about passwords, specifically about multi-factor authentication and some of the attacks that you can try to avoid. So I try to keep that there. Uh, don't share your passwords. I know it's tempting. Hey, this is a really cool password. Here it is for my Netflix account. Try not to do that because you tend to use the same password for everything. So keep them to yourselves. Uh, watch for unsolicited and unexpected messages. You know, this, this goes back to the phishing, watching out for phishing and these other type of attack vectors. Just keep an eye on your direct messages through social media, emails, text messages, because that's more also more they're going to like. Don't click on unknown links. I'm going to keep it at that point. But if you see a link in your email and you don't know what it does, just don't. Or verify. You know, if it says it comes from the Commonwealth Bank, pick up the phone and call the Commonwealth Bank and say, hey, did you send this to me? Or if it's a friend that texts it to you, send them an email and say, did you mean to send that to me? Our time is your weapon, always verify it. That's what I say. You can always, well, I shouldn't say always. You can mostly undo cybercrime most of the time simply by taking your time to make a decision and verify. Because there's that expectation that they're sitting there waiting for you to respond when the reality is they've probably sent out 10,000 messages and they're just waiting to see who's going to click first. Monitor your accounts and devices because sometimes if something is happening to your computer or to your phone, it'll start to behave erratically. Random pop-ups. It'll shut off. Other weird things start to happen. You might see mysterious transactions on your account. Keep an eye on things. We mostly all have, anybody that does online banking, has an app on their phone for the bank. Pop it open, take a skim through the charges once in a while, make sure everything's legit. Some key takeaways, run a defensive game. Uh, get as much information as you can. Please, don't do it alone. Just do not take it alone. Uh, you can read, research, watch YouTube videos, talk to people all you want. Don't take this on alone. Uh, professional advice never goes sideways. And again, this is all purely based on my opinion and my experience. Hopefully you found it useful. Uh, there's my contact details. And this time what I've done is I've put some helpful links on the side of the screen. So you can take a picture of this. You've got my contact details. I'll, uh, if anybody's trying to take a picture on this side, I'll try to get out of the way. Uh, so my YouTube, LinkedIn, Spotify, and of course my email. And even after the cruise is done, if you've got a question, if you came to one of my sessions and you say, you know what, I really wish I would have asked that, please email me, and I'm more than happy to respond to you. So on the other side, you've got ID Care. They're an outfit that actually started at the University of Sunshine Coast a little over 10 years ago. And uh, a gentleman by the name of David Lacey runs this. I know David fairly well. And uh, some of his compatriots, I've dealt with them extensively, and they've made a huge difference in the lives of people and businesses alike. Uh, of course, ScamWatch. Cyber.gov.au, that's run by the government itself. It's got heaps of really good information for individuals, for small businesses, for big businesses. It's a wealth of information. Feel free to go in and poke around. And again, if you ever get lost in this sort of stuff, you just don't know, you're looking for something very specific, you can reach out to me anytime, anyway. Even if it's not through these means, even if you spot me on you know, Facebook or Instagram or something like that, just reach out to me because I'm more than willing to help you. So I'll try to take a few questions. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of time. Yes, we actually not running over, so Damien's not going to hurt me this time. He never did before. I love Damien. Anybody got questions? Up at the back. Okay, so. So that's a great question. So the question is mostly dealing with, you know, uh, kind of that, that invasiveness, you know, whether or not someone can actually get into your computer. They film you on your webcam, uh, and then they use that imagery perhaps to do to extort you. Uh, am I correct in that? Okay. So in that particular case, 
Yes, there's what they call a rat attack or a remote access Trojan or a remote access tool, whichever you call it. And in that particular case, someone gets in your computer and then takes it over and then they activate your webcam to watch you. Um, and it doesn't have to be the webcam specifically, it could be security cameras in your house. Now there's an application called Shodan um, that you can go onto and you can type the name of the device and it'll scour the web for unsecured webcams and then you can look at someone's living room, you can look at someone's driveway, you can watch traffic going across a bridge in San Francisco. The thing about putting the post-it note over the camera, I don't call that paranoid anymore because at one time we used to think it was paranoid but I don't think that's too far from the truth. Because not everybody's going to take note whether or not the webcam is actually on. You're looking at your screen, you're not looking to see if the light is on. Some malware will actually turn the camera light off so you don't know that it's on. A lot of modern laptops actually come with a little slider built in that you can cover the webcam. But if you're not on a Zoom chat or something like that, uh, a little different. I guess if you're using an external webcam, let's just say you an external monitor, you an external webcam, put a piece of paper over it. Post-it notes, they work absolutely perfect, but there's very good merit in that. Thank you for bringing that up, that's great. Yes? If you know you're getting attacked, Okay, so you're wondering if turning your computer off during an attack, something happens. Uh, the sh uh, turning the computer off, does that stop the attack? Well, if the machine is powered off, they can't really do much else. In which case, I'd probably be more inclined to disconnect it from the internet because they would be accessing it remotely. So. You know, the, the whole thing about pulling the blue cable? It's similar. There should be probably either a switch on your laptop or a setting that you can access easily to disable the wireless. Uh, but you know what? Closing the lid and turning it off altogether and then contacting someone might be a really good way to go about it. Because some people realize something's going on. Uh, what, what did that guy say? I don't know. Take the easiest solution. If it's turning it off, if it's closing the lid of the laptop, unplugging it from the wall, whatever you need to do, do it. And that's a very effective way. Because once they've lost connectivity, powered off, that's the end of it. But there's always a possibility that the minute you power it back on, that connection could resume. So that's why you need to get a little bit of assistance to do a cleanup. I can probably take a couple more. So you're wondering how they communicate with you if the computer's locked up. Interestingly enough, it's not fully locked up. Yeah, it does turn it into a brick, but it basically only enables the features that they need to communicate with you. That would be it. Like, they won't completely brick a computer because it comes useless. Although I have seen cases where there'll at least be a phone number and then you have to call them, and then they'll give you the code over the phone once you've kind of done the whole thing. That, it's pretty rare, but usually basic, basic functionality will remain, which is where you can click on that button and then talk to them. And it's basically disabled every other feature of the computer completely, the only communication that you've got is with the cyber criminal. So that's actually a really good point. Thank you. Yes? Sorry? What's... So what about the deep fakes? Okay, so deep fakes are definitely a big threat with ransomware. It's growing. Okay? I actually appreciate you brought that up because deep fakes are becoming a very effective thing. Uh, even though it's not you and they've created a deep fake of you, whether it's intimate image abuse or you doing something else or saying something else, that is definitely a very effective tactic for ransomware. You pay us or we're going to release this to the world because a lot of people are simply going to see it and accept it at face value and believe that it is you and then you're spending a whole lot of time trying to unmix the paint, as it were. And a lot of famous figures have had to deal with this. Taylor Swift is currently dealing with this. Politicians, a whole lot of other people are dealing with this very very thing. It's nefarious and it's growing in popularity, so I really thank you for bringing that one up. Probably take one more. Fantastic. Folks, I hope you stick around for uh, Knockout or the, the game with Demo. It's, uh, it's awesome. Have a lot of fun, but thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it, guys.